looking, sir. You're going to look over at me. All right. Check, check, one, two, three, one, two, three, for recording purposes. If I can get your name, please. Hi, my name is Jonathan Antoine. I love that. And the name of this show is? Beyond the Curtain, or just Beyond, as I've been calling it. Fantastic. Coming down in three, two, and one. My friend, it is great to see you here in Toronto because as we speak at the Winter Garden Theatre, it's cold out there, it's raining, but I just need you to know, as we speak, Toronto fans are really, really happy because the Toronto Raptors yes. are heading closer and closer to the championship in the NBA. So look at this. We have the Raptors doing extremely well, and we've got you here in Toronto to promote a show that you're doing here. How does it feel being here in the city? It's awesome. I mean, I love Canada in general, and... Toronto is a wonderful city, and as you can probably see around us, this theatre is just incredible. So yeah, I'm, I'm ecstatic. I cannot wait to hear your voice in here, because yeah, this is one of the iconic theatres here in the city, here in Canada alone. So many great performances, now you're going to be part of this history you know and you know when i talked about the raptors the raptors are so inspiring you my friend are so also inspiring british got talent i mean the things that you've done and accomplished did you ever think that you'd be able to reach the pinnacle the way you have and there's so much more coming for you too well thank you very much for one and i mean of course when anyone starts a journey of any kind they can never truly understand exactly what the destination will be um there will always be surprises in store for them. And for me, yeah, it's been one surprise after another. <laughs> I, I never expected this even this journey to even begin. So looking back and seeing, you know, there have been a lot of hardships. There have been some, uh, some crazy things that have happened along the way. But to be here is, yeah, it's... Um, Life affirming. <laughs> the thing is, though, you've taken those hardships, no matter how tough things have, you've always turned them into a positive. I want to talk about those things, about the children's books and, and, you know, and the performances and stuff like that. But I want to go into the beginning of this on the love of music. And when did you even realize that you had the incredible voice and talent that you have? Well, I've just always been interested in music ever since I was, you know, well, pretty much born. I mean, when I was three years old, I would sing along to the radio and stuff. But... I guess I just never stopped, right? Some people uh, kind of enjoy it as a hobby, whereas I just, I never stopped. I kept it going and I just, I really enjoy it. What can I say? It's, um, it's always been a passion thing for me. People kind of started to say that I could, you know, go and try out for some music school, stuff like that when I was around 10 years old. And I, I just took that encouragement on even more strongly and yeah. As I say, I never stopped. I um, always just wanted to sing, to, or at least to make people happy in some way, to affect their lives, and yeah, to uh, bring a little bit of happiness into people's lives. You know, we always have those dreams. Did you also have those people that would turn around and say, what do you think you're doing? Come on, you're not going to do, come, you, know, you know, go work in a factory or something. You're not going to do this. I mean, I think everyone uh, in the course of their life will have their detractors. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, honestly, uh, that is a way of keeping myself grounded. Um, I mean, even, I think it's, it's actually kind of important, really, to always have something that you can fall back on, just in case things fall apart, because this industry is, um, is brutal. It's a fickle and crazy place. So, really, those, those people who say, you know, have something else on your plate and, um, you know, go work in a factory, whatever. They're really looking out for you, in a way. True. <laughs> and just want to make sure I say this, nothing wrong with working in a factory, but it's not your dream, though. But your dream did end up being on television in a very popular competition with Simon Cowell sitting in front of you, my friend. What was that like? Because you were only, like, what, 17, 16, something like that? I think I was 17 at the time. I might have been 16. Goodness me. It's been seven years since then, but I can still remember the day as if it were yesterday. It's crazy. The, like the lighting of the set and how, you know, these giant spotlights kind of beam down on the judges panel. 
you know, it's kind of a sight that you never forget and then shrouded in darkness this entire arena full of people who as soon as you walk on the stage they're judging you based on you know nothing really based on how you look at first and then to uh, deliver a performance and have a lot of people kind of change their minds and value what I'm doing. That's that's really, it's great for me. I want to know, though, when those people all stood up and cheered and Simon saying that you are phenomenal, what was that moment like? I mean, seriously, it was probably dark. It's probably hard to see the audience, but <laughs> to know that they're standing up and cheering and clapping and screaming off the top of the lungs, what's that feeling like? I mean, is there any way that a person can describe that feeling accurately? I, I honestly have no idea. It's the only way that you can truly understand that experience is by experiencing it. Being on stage and having an entire arena of people stand up and to finally feel, maybe for one of the first times in your life, that what you do is truly appreciated and that people really like you. It's... Uh, Oh, it's something else. Absolutely, my friend. That kick-started your career. When things started to roll and you, you realize, yes, I can do this, now it's time, the business side starts to come in. It's now trying to form you and figure out how you are going to do things. How did you go about choosing the right songs for you to perform? Because you do the classical, you do the Disney, you do the, you know, the pop and stuff. How did that all come about? Well... Throughout my career, I've gone through a lot of kind of image dysphoria almost, where I'm, I've been unsure, <laughs> <laughs> unsure as to where exactly the direction of my career is going, what kind of air I should be giving off. But throughout it all, I think the primary thing that has really kept me going is just being myself and being a person, which it's very, very easy to forget when you see someone on TV, when you kind of see someone as a public figure, it's easy to forget that they are just a person. They are the same biological matter. They have DNA too. They're just another person just like you. And it's, yeah, it's very easy to forget that when you see someone on TV. And I think that keeping that thread, making sure that you remember that you are the same as everyone else, you just have a certain passion and hopefully that can enhance and influence someone else's life. That's, that's a key thing for me. Speaking of influences, you got to perform with some great people, too. Can you give us some of the names, please? Uh, Placido Domingo, Rolando Villason. Those are two of my absolute, you know, top moments. Uh, a lot of people kind of from the, uh, the UK classical crossover scene, Catherine Jenkins, Russell Watson. And as I say, these are all, you know, they're public figures and they're these huge, you know, sensations. But in the end, they are all just people with the same complex struggles as anyone else. And seeing that, understanding that, is um, something else. So how did you have time to co-write a children's book? or so? <laughs> And what's this about, too, please? So this is kind of um, an anti-bullying story. It's uh, loosely based on my life. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a co-write, and I had a lot of fun with it. It's just... Just a sweet little story about a porcupine who, um, you know, is perceived as uh, prickly and uh, hard to approach, but under it all, just wants to uh, sing and improve other people's lives. In the book, sir, it's, it's called? Jonathan the Porcupine. I love this. What I love more, though, is, like I said, we got you here in Toronto, my friend, for a couple of days. What is this show going to be like? What are we going to hear? This... I've said it before, this is going to be the biggest show, the best show that I have ever put on in my life. And I, I don't think I've ever said that before about any show, so I do not say these things lightly. When I say that, I mean the repertoire is the best that it's ever been. It's uh, split into three sections. One that is kind of autobiographical for a struggling child, a young child who feels, you know, disassociated from uh, society maybe and feels themselves a bit of an, uh, a reject, an outcast and their struggle and their eventual triumph. That's the first part of the show. <laughs> That's just the first part. The second part is um, kind of these songs that are ingrained into our cultural DNA, these um, 
stuff like Unchained Melody and Moon River, just these, these great songs, the classic American songbook almost. And then that final section is going to be those classical arias, including a song that I have not yet sung, but it is so ubiquitous that people assume that I already have. And you'll have to come to the show to find out what that is. I was hoping you were <laughs> going to tell us, and I was hoping you were going to do that. So I love that. I cannot wait for this, my friend. This is going to be fantastic. Look, I know we're going to have to wrap this up because you got more interviews. you got things you got to do. you got to take care of that voice. Last thing I want you to do is lose that. And people going, Rudy, you made him do an interview and he can't sing? Yeah, we'll get you for that. No. But here's the thing what's really important, too. Because you're such an inspiration, what advice can you give people who are trying to follow their dreams, but they're just hitting that wall? What do you think is going to help them get over that wall? <laughs> You've hit me with a really tough one there. For you did it, though, my friend. But for every single person, I would say that it's, comp it's a different process. The ideal thing is to create a support system, a network of people who you can rely on. That's where I got incredibly lucky. And I would say that it's very easy to forget that there is a tremendous amount of luck involved in these things. There is random chance. I got a very lucky break. And I think that as long as you jump at every opportunity that you possibly can, you can hopefully get that lucky break as well. Social media, where do we go to follow you with releasing albums, touring around the world, and getting you to come back to Toronto? Where do we go to follow you? I am Jonathan Antoine or John Antoine on every social media platform. You can Google me. I am out there. I am very easy to find. So come and pester me if uh, you'd like me anywhere. We love you, my friend. Look, congratulations on all success. Looking forward to the show. And before we go, any new music going to be released soon? Oh, yeah. This, this whole show is being turned into an album as well. Ah! <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, it's going to be a three-part album, which is, again, a thing that no one really does anymore. Um, it's kind of structured around that theater kind of thing in the three acts structure. And, yeah, it's the same repertoire from the show. So if you happen to not be in Toronto, you can always purchase the album. Uh, we'll purchase the album, and we're coming to the show. Jonathan, thank you so much for this interview, man. Can't wait for the show. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.